کیسے کوئی اختیار نہیں کون سیل بسم اللہ السلام علیکم گڈ مارننگ لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹلمن اینڈ ویلکم ٹو کیپ سارک اینڈ دی 44th اے ائی ای ای انٹرنیشنل کانفرنس مائی نیم از سدیم الحسین ام ان اکنامک سولوشنز لیڈ ہیئر ان کیپ سارک ورکنگ پرائمرلی اون ڈیٹا ماڈلز اینڈ سیمولیٹرز As the title suggests, our session today will focus on data availability, accessibility, and the challenges facing modelers and policymakers. Our experts here serve in different domains as data publishers, aggregators, facilitators, regulators, and consumers. During the session, we will discuss how to advance data availability and improve transparency to arrive at the right data-driven policy decisions. We will highlight the need to a regular, up-to-date, and detailed time series data supplies to models and simulators that will evaluate policy pathways and options. If you allow me, I'll start by, by highlighting the work that my team here in CAPSARC accomplished during the past eight years. The solution productization team was formed for the purpose of improving the understanding of energy economics through open data platforms and insights. In 2016, we launched CAPSARC Data Portal to host over 1,200 public data sets related to energy, economy, and climate. Critical, granular, and relevant and up-to-date data from over 250 sources is available and open for all in an easy-to-use, machine-readable platform. Data is collected, transformed, and made available to modelers and policymakers to run models and simulators without relying on proprietary data. This session will focus primarily on data. However, we will be hosting another session today at 4 p.m. here in the main hall to take a deep dive look from the models and simulators perspective. With that, please allow me to introduce my panelists today. To my left is Dr. Rolando Fuentes. He is a research professor at eGate Business School at Tech de Monterey. He's also a visiting researcher here in CAPSARC and Oxford Institute of Energy Studies. Rolando's research focuses on innovation in the power sector, a new business and regulatory model for electricity transitions. Hello. Thank you very much. Dr. Andreas, you saw him in the session previously. Dr. Andreas Schaeffer is a professor of energy transport at the UCL Energy Institute, where he is also the director of Air Transportation System Laboratory. Dr. Andreas' advisory role includes the UK Airport Commissions, the Aerospace Technology Institute, and the Industry Strategy Challenge on Future Flight, among others. Hello, Dr. Andreas. Najlas Dairy is the Policy and Awareness Supervisor at the Oil Sustainability Program under the Supreme Committee of Hydrocarbon Materials. She works on raising awareness and building policy strategies to support the utilization of hydrocarbon materials from both an economic and environmental point of view. Haikala Najla. We have also Omar Baslayman, who is the Director of Data Governance from the Ministry of Energy. Omar is a data management and governance expert with an extensive experience in development and implementation of data solutions for a variety of organizations. Hayakallah, <laughs> Omar. Last but not least is Dr. Abdullah Thnayan, the General Director of Spatial and Resources Statistics at the General Authority of Statistics. Dr. Abdullah also is a board member in the National Urban Observatory Council, and before joining the JSTAT, he worked at the National Information Center and the Decision Support Center. Hayakallah, Dr. Abdullah. In the next few minutes, our speaker will provide us through their opening statement and insight on their achievements, strategies, and action that their organization are undertaking regarding data availability and transparency. They will also share with us some of the major development in technologies related to the transformation of data into the digital world. Thank you all. Please, Rando, take it away. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation, uh, Sadim. And uh, when we were planning for this session, uh, Sadim and I were uh, discussing how I, an economist, a uh, social scientist, uh, can interact with, this, uh, uh, with data scientists. No, uh, what is the interaction, what is the need for, for this uh, uh, communication. So in my, the next few minutes, I will try to take uh, two, two steps back and uh, try to frame the problem how I see it from the point of, uh, of, of my own perspective. Um, so the, the, the economics of data are very particular. And data is uh, embedded more and more in our economic activity. 
Uh, so it's important to understand what is the driver of this and how we generate, what is the supply and demand of, uh, of data, and what, is, what are the key economics principles for, for this. Uh, so uh, data is not depletable. It's a not depletable uh, uh, resource, meaning that anyone can use it at the same time. Um, also, the more data that we have, say, think in terms of our economies of scale, the more relevant it is uh, to make analysis, uh, to come up with new ideas, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it is also an externality, a positive one. And therefore, the, the consequence of that is that less data will be produced if left to only to the markets, or if left, left only to, to, to individuals. Now, that is about to change in, my, in, in, my, uh, uh, in the third point that, that, I, that I will make. Uh, so, but initially, uh, it is therefore the role of governments to provide, to capture, to register, to publish data that may be relevant for uh, decision makers. Uh, and there, that's where uh, 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 statistic agencies from governments enter into this equation. No? Uh, so from a data user, from a research uh, perspective, uh, what we want from you is that data is available, is transparent, it's uh, easy to digest, um, it's comparable, uh, and uh, that has the quality that at least uh, 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 we can use I think that summarizes what we need is trust, that we can use this data uh, uh, with, uh, in, with trust. Um, now, uh, this is about to change because uh, new technologies like digitalization open up a new avenue for this data generation, this data aggregation, uh, and in a way it's a shift from this centralized way to gather data to a decentralized way uh, uh, to uh, come up with the new databases, uh, new data sets, uh, thanks to the digitalization. No? So digitalization, it's also another type of, of, uh, of externality. No? Uh, with digitalization, it records all the pro processes, for example, that were not captured before. No? If we go to Amazon, uh, think about in the 1990s, uh, you wanted to record uh, uh, a sale, and you only have uh, prices and quantities, perhaps the time of the day, etc. With Amazon, it gets recorded, it rec gets into the, in, into the uh, 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 records, uh, the process that you made. You, know, uh, you click here first, you discarded some product, you probably put it in the basket, and you bought it 30 days later, or you bought it immediately. So all this uh, uh, process, it's a way of understanding also another externality. You know? uh, this, so, so we move from a world where data was centralized to this disaggregated uh, uh, way of data. So the role of agencies and uh, 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 people like, uh, um, uh, like Sadim who are in the interface between users and producers change. No? Uh, now what we want is data to be available but also clean. Uh, there are further questions of uh, who is the propriety uh, uh, of data. Uh, and. Uh, the important, so we move from a, a world of a data scarcity to data abundance. Uh, this changes the way we do research. Uh, perhaps with more data, we can answer the same questions just better because we have a, a more information. Uh, but also, we can probably, because data is more granular, is more frequent, is more timely, uh, we can break down research question into smaller pieces. So therefore, we have, I mean, we, we, we can generate knowledge in another way. Um, but also we can think of uh, new questions that we haven't asked before. No, questions that for which uh, we never think in the past because just data wasn't available. And I think that that's the interesting part of the new uh, era, of the new way of, uh, of doing research. And uh, while I was preparing this uh, 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 presentation, uh, I was uh, thinking, take this to one extreme and think, what would be the role of researchers if data is completely abundant, where you can have anything you want? Yeah? Uh, now, there can also be, so that, that, that's a, a question for food, uh, uh, as a food of thought, uh, but I also worry that there could be a, a data divide between poor countries, rich countries, or populations, those who are 
uh, 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 have access to digital technologies and those who do not. So uh, with this, um, I finish my, my first uh, intervention. I think, thank you, Rolanda, so much. Thank you for highlighting the importance of data for policymakers. Uh, Andreas, please take it. Okay, so, so um, I can talk a little bit about our experience, and I say our uh, experience of my colleagues and mine in our Air Transportation Systems Lab as it relates to data. Um, so what we do is we, we simulate the global air transportation system, and um, one of the questions, no, let's say in general what we're looking at is um, simulating the impact of perturbations to the system. So this could be a new runway at any airport, this could be uh, you know, a completely new airport somewhere, it could be uh, introduction of disruptive technology, it could be climate change policy and the like. And, and then we simulate how, how this event propagates through the system because there's lots of competition and if you add a new runway there, then the effects will propagate through the entire planet ultimately. Um, now for this exercise, we need lots of data, um, mainly to estimate demand models and to um, estimate the starting point of um, the supply side. So for example, um, in terms of demand models, um, we look at um, income per person in a specific region. We look at the population size or household, number of households. Um, we look at the income distribution um, and of course the airfare and, and so forth and so forth. And, and in order for these, um, uh, the, these numbers to, to have, uh, we need to purchase expensive data sets. So th just to give you a, a, an idea, we, we just p purchased a, a data set from an aggregator. So this is like, you know, uh, let's say from, from a company which retrieves uh, numbers from aggregators like Expedia and Skyscanner and so forth. And we paid nearly $30,000 for a one year license. So that's quite, quite expensive. And there's no way that this data will ever be uh, openly available. And of course, we are very much restricted in terms of how we can use the data, and there's no way we can publish one single number. We use, we use uh, this data, for example, to estimate air transportation demand from the true origin to the ultimate destination. You can get, at very low cost, or sometimes for free, you can get segmented data um, in air travel, which doesn't help you, because you want to know where the passenger boarded, let's say Riyadh, and where the passenger ended up, let's say, um, San Diego, California. And there are at least, there's at least one transfer in between, I suspect. So if you only estimated a model from Riyadh to New York and another model from New York to San Diego, you wouldn't get a um, realistic reflection of the demand be between these two markets. So, so we need the true origin, ultimate destination. Um, and again, that's expensive, and it, there's no way we, this data can be shared. Um, it's, it's even more, more challenging in, in freight transportation, air freight. Um, there's only one provider, and that provider refused to sell us their data because they got nervous that we would um, you know, uh, use it for our models that would uh, compete with their activities. So we had to go to the, uh, you know, to the, to the origin and um, uh, look at uh, United Nations comp trade data. These are the trade matrices uh, between virtually all countries on the planet. They tell you the commodities that have been traded between any country, um, and they tell you sometimes the transportation mode. Um, so we have to work out the value of the commodities, their natures, are they perishable, non-perishable products, what mode they have been transported, and then you can estimate uh, choice models that help you then assigning these various commodities to air transportation. And then of course there's a whole sequence of, of follow-on steps in order to include them in, in these models. Um, there are a few exceptions. So for the United States, there, there's, that's, a, that's the only country essentially that's relatively well documented in terms of openly accessible data because airlines have to report their operational and financial data from a certain um, amount of revenue on. And that's high quality data, and again, that's openly available. But again, this is um, an exception, it's not the rule. Right. 
thank you, Andreas. Thank you on touching on the topic of the data use license. We will get back to this uh, later on. And then also for the challenges associated with um, data usage. Um, you also touch on the cost of the high quality uh, uh, data, which is, uh, we are struggling with the um, propriety data that we use in our models and simulators and uh, the cost associated with this data. So Najla, you will touch on the uh, regional perspective of data availability, please go ahead. Perfect, um, thank you very much Sadim and, and, and thank you uh, CAPSARC for this wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, so as part of OSP's policy efforts, um, we do aim to facilitate as well as utilize evidence for the pursuit of, let's say, uplifting demand for hydrocarbons, which is something that you had mentioned in my introduction. But with that being said, we as a program obviously have uh, certain challenges that we're currently um, going through. And that is not specific to us, but it's sort of this worldly transition away from hydrocarbons. Um, in order for me to kind of navigate that transition, I need data and I need factual data. Um, and what we are facing currently is that data may be there, but very hard to access. Whether it's, you know, your inability to actually find it online or having so many different let's say, challenging hurdles that come your way to get access, whether it's price, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, you can use it or not, uh, and so on. Um, and, and the reason why I want to mention this, because, you know, if I use the example of, let's say, electrical vehicles, um, you know, there are a lot of transitions away from uh, fossil fuel based cars. And uh, this comes with many, I would say, uh, reasonings. One could be um, economic value in the long run, uh, environmental value, and so on. Um, but what if the data that was accessible also showcased well to wheel emissions of EVs versus internal combustion engines? What if that data? is available to the point where your average individual is able to see it. And the reason why I mention, you know, average citizens is because I do believe that policy is sort of a circular motion. It's not linear. You know, your, your average individual uh, influences your mun municipal level. That influences, let's say, your uh, um, legislative level, and then it goes up to the executive. And, if we do not enable um, that data to actually be uh, advocated for, then we miss a lot of the gap in creating the policies that actually influence us, makes us better communities, and so on. Uh, and this is not just specific to this example. It really can be applied on anything. Um, and we as a government program, we do believe that we have a role to play in making this data, as you had mentioned, accessible, but also available. Um, whether it's through funding those entities uh, that can aggregate them, publish them, or we can become a building bridge between those that are coming up with the data and those that could potentially utilize it. Raising awareness around it, making it accessible for people, publicizing it in means that we are able to do so. Um, and I, I am sure that as, as part of this conversation, as well as my colleague from the Ministry of Energy, will we'll, we'll have some insight as to the role of you know, uh, government institutions in this process. But I did want to shed light with regards to data accessibility, because I think that's where a lot of the gap with policy making um, happens as well. Thank you, Najla. Uh, so you, thank you for highlighting the challenges of accessing data and also the role of government programs of uh, opening the data to all and to especially for students and users to use the data and their research. Uh, Omar, you will take us through the data management program in the Ministry of Energy, which is a fairly new program that started, I think, two years ago. Yeah. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Um, uh, 
if you allow me, I will go a step back. From, I will talk about data from national perspective, then I will uh, take the, uh, the opportunity to talk about the Data Management Office and the Ministry of Energy. Uh, under the leadership of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Vision 2030 initiated multiple initiatives and programs uh, to enable uh, and cover the data sector. Uh, one of them, for example, initiate, uh, in establishing the Data Management Office and establishing the, the Saudi Data and AI Authority, um, uh, which means that the data is a key success factor for the national development. Uh, in the Ministry of Energy, we established um, the Data Management Office, which will be responsible about the governance and the management of data. Uh, our goal is uh, to, uh, to support decision makers and make sure that we can achieve uh, economic, and, uh, economic gains and competitive gains from data. Uh, as you may know, uh, the, the energy sector is very big and uh, we are uh, collecting data and generating data across the ecosystem in the private sector and the public sector. Not all the data is generated in the ministry itself. So, uh, the challenge is to uh, collect this data and analyze it and build the models and the simulators and then avail it to the ecosystem and avail it to the public through the open data, open data channels. Um, so uh, currently in the data management office, we are building the policies that will enable this kind of data sharing and availability. And also uh, we are developing the policies and procedures to make sure that the data is uh, w within the standard that we accept uh, with, uh, in high, with uh, high quality and uh, process the right way and manage the right way. Um, uh, for example, the ministry right now is working to implement uh, the Energy Information and Knowledge Center, which will be the data hub for all the energy, se uh, energy sector data in the, in the kingdom uh, by collecting this data and analyze it, analyzing it and then availing it to the uh, ecosystem again. Uh, so um, I think across this panel we will talk about multiple dimensions about data. Uh, so uh, I, will be tr I will try to, uh, to focus on the governance part from, uh, for it to make sure that uh, we have the whole story here. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Dr. Abdullah from the publisher side, the JSTAT is the main publisher of data here in Saudi Arabia. Please. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, for having me uh, here. And uh, actually, we at JSTAT uh, uh, have uh, focused for many years on publishing uh, statistics that are related to energies. Uh, we focused mainly on, on, on the stocks and the operation side of the statistics, but uh, recently uh, we are uh, we try to uh, take further uh, leap into publishing more data on on, on the labor uh, force connected to the energy sector and then the economics and the st structural uh, business uh, or, or the structural of, uh, structure of, of, of uh, energy businesses inside the country, uh, leading to publishing uh, what we have done uh, recently, the supply and use table, input and um, output tables, which details uh, the, the consumption uh, and the final output in uh, monetary values of, of energy sector and all other, uh, and all other sectors by, by Isaac and by uh, product. Uh, we, uh, we, what, what, we are embarking now on is, uh, and I agree with Rolando, uh, Ro uh, Professor, uh, 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 in his note that we live in, in the world of uh, abundance, especially in t when it comes on to data. Uh, but the, what's what's needed now is a more reorganization uh, of of this data in a way that makes it easily accessible and consumed by researchers. So we rely more on, on standardization and making it more comparable uh, with, uh, and, that, and to follow uh, the, the st international standards. And uh, we also seek uh, to engage with the stakeholders. Uh, we recently uh, engaged with the Center for uh, Energy Efficiency, for example. We discovered they need uh, micro data 
at very granular level to cover some details of what policymakers need to, to do uh, some nudging uh, campaigns uh, for, for energy efficiency programs. So we are uh, d engaging with stakeholders during the planning of uh, statistical production in order to uh, uh, cover the needs uh, of stakeholders and uh, to make our uh, publications, uh, which we uh, do a lot of effort to publish, uh, usable uh, and, uh, and beneficial to uh, other uh, users, including government agencies or researchers. Uh, we also uh, noticed that uh, we live in a world that's connected, so uh, we have to connect uh, statistics about energy to other activities and other uh, economic activities uh, and, and uh, natural resources statistics, which, which usually concerns about the stocks and, and uh, flows. And, in the natural resources, as well as uh, we found that uh, there is a focus recently on not only capturing the economic value of, of, uh, of whatever activity we are measuring, but also there is a focus and it's new uh, demand for uh, capturing the environmental cost of that activity. And uh, that's, that's amazing because uh, and challenging in the same time. Uh, uh, so uh, that's my uh, take on, 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 on what we do currently at just that. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, you touched on a very important note, which is the relationship between the data publishers and consumers and to, uh, to provide the good data and high, very high quality level of data, we need to all collaborate in uh, producing the data that is relevant to the models and simulators. Yeah. Uh, I thank all of you for the insightful presentation. It opened a lot of discussion point for me and also I think for the uh, audience. I'll go back to a point that you raised, Dr. Abdullah, on the expansion of the data sets, the coverage. So can we fairly state that there is indeed an expansion in the coverage of data sets and also in the level of details of the regional and also international data. Uh, Andreas, if you can cover it from the international perspective, do you think that there is indeed an, uh, an expansion in the coverage of data? Not, not really. Um, you know, what, what has been out there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is still out there. It's being updated, but in, in my area, I can't see a, a trend towards um, you know, open data, because they're, you know, uh, they can be easily sold, and the very existence of these companies build upon mm. assembling these data sets and selling them at astronomical prices. And um, th th again, you know, that, that data that's out there um, often is not really useful because it may not reflect you know, the systems view that you need in order to, you know, estimate the models you're interested in. There, there are some, some exceptions. I mentioned the US, and I'm currently thinking about uh, the International Passenger Survey in the UK, but this has, has also been ongoing for decades in which, um, you know, when you arrive at Heathrow Airport and you've got bad <coughs> luck, then you're pulled over by someone and they question you about, you know, um, where you're coming from, where you want to go, how much you paid, what's the purpose of your trip, and so forth. And um, that's, that's very useful information for some, you know, some part of what you're doing. But, but again, this has been around for a long time. And from the regional perspective, Dr. Abdullah? Uh, we actually noticed uh, 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 increase in demand of, of uh, granular data. Uh, for example, aside from the uh, launch of yesterday's or, or recent platform from Ministry of, uh, of, of Energy, uh, we are participating in uh, two uh, major uh, data uh, uh, availability platforms. Uh, one is launched by Ministry of Economic and Planning. It's, uh, uh, it's regarding uh, uh, <coughs> or to cover the uh, indicators about uh, 
com regional competitiveness uh, inside uh, king uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the other one is uh, the urban uh, observatory, the national urban observatory. While the the the, the one uh, one is, is uh, trying to focus on data at uh, internal regional level, the the one the urban observatory is seeking data at more granular spatial scales, uh, like talking about cities, we talk about uh, neighborhoods, uh, uh, so population per neighborhood, and then uh, green areas, public places, energy, uh, uh, and uh, economic activities, uh, number of houses. Talk about, they, they try to get very, very granular details about the, neighbor, the neighborhoods uh, they are serving. And they, they also uh, asking us to uh, keep the population <coughs> counts within these uh, spatial scales uh, updated uh, on a uh, on a annual uh, basis, so they can measure their KPIs. Aside from that, is also uh, many uh, national parks or conservation uh, areas. They also manage their areas. W which, which encompasses some s small villages and some small uh, populated area, we call them. So they ask for very uh, granular details about uh, the populations they are uh, living inside these uh, uh, protected areas to make sure they don't change the heritage or the culture of these areas. So we see a very uh, high demand on, on the depth and the breadth of data about uh, inside the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So uh, moving to technology and trends. Um, Omar, we're seeing the increase of number of the API-ready data sources, including JSTAT published their data source uh, database recently. SAMA as well is building their own database. So what other tools and uh, you're using to collect and analyze the massive amount of data that is available? Um, currently, the kingdom is advancing in the digital, uh, digital uh, systems. Very, they are ad advancing in multiple dimensions. Um, uh, so we are adopting multiple technologies, just as, such as uh, IoT and other technologies, AI. Uh, these technologies are producing a huge amount of data. So uh, these data generated should need to be collected and managed and. Uh, analyzed to gain the benefits of this data. Uh, so in the Ministry of Energy, we found uh, through our uh, strategic direction in 2021, uh, we started to implement the Energy and uh, energy Information Knowledge Center, um, which the main goal of this center is to collect the data from the ecosystem. So uh, the, the, uh, the data we are collecting th through multiple technologies, so through APIs, uh, through uh, sometimes it's files. So sometimes it's aggregated, sometimes it's uh, raw data. So uh, we found there is a need to uh, manage this data and process it before uh, storing it in the data warehouse. Um, so uh, we have a group of, of engineers, brilliant engineers. Uh, they are working to uh, model the data and uh, make sure that it's available. Uh, for uh, for uh, any further uh, analyti analytics or um, AI solutions uh, that is uh, implemented in the ministry. Uh, so um, uh, the main challenge when we uh, collect this data is to make sure that the quality is uh, appropriate. <coughs> uh, so uh, we worked in multiple uh, th uh, technologies to make sure that the data uh, we will avail in the future, it's uh, uh, processed the right way. Uh, so uh, we worked in multiple policies and processes uh, to, uh, to, make it, uh, to, to make it up to the standard, uh, depending on uh, best practices from DAMA and other uh, institutes uh, related to data management and governance. Thank you, Omar. So for you, Rolando and Andreas, as a consumer of the data, 
what sources and how to distinguish between the primary and secondary sources of data for your projects? Go ahead, Rolanda. Okay. Either, either it's my hearing or it's the acoustics or both. It's a bit, uh, yeah. Okay, so. I'm getting older, that's what I'm <laughs> No worries, I'll ask again. So as a consumer <laughs> of data, how you distinguish between the, um, the data, primary and secondary sources of data for your projects? So, so um, you know, there is this challenge already when we purchase these, uh, these expensive data sets because um, the primary data in these data sets is what they receive from the Expedias and Skyscanners of this world, but, but not the data that relates to those ticket sales um, that are purchased directly from the airline. And so what, what these uh, companies do is they've got their own models in order to manufacture the data that is missing. Again, the data that's, you know, tickets that were purchased from the airlines directly. So, so it's, a, it's a massive task on our end then to go carefully through this data set because it contains both primary and secondary data, if you wish, and, and try to figure out, um, you know, where are errors and where it needs corrections on, on our end, which is an already tertiary data, if you want. Uh, yes, um, I, actually, I, I was uh, thinking in your previous uh, participation, um, I've just mentioned that uh, data is a public good and therefore governments have to provide it. No? And then there are some changes uh, and uh, uh, that it make it easier, less costly to record data because digitalization. Uh, but this opens up a new market. No? You were saying I mean, these data companies that uh, provide big data sets are very expensive. Um, which makes sense, no? Because uh, th therefore, I mean, if data <coughs> is uh, uh, so important, you have to create some barriers so that it doesn't become a public good again. Uh, there are uh, alternative ways also depending on the research question that you are addressing. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the work that we, uh, I with uh, some colleagues with, uh, at CAPSAR uh, are doing. Uh, we are interested in uh, mapping the innovation in the electricity sector. Uh, so for that, we are... Uh, we, we constructed a database of startups. Yeah, we thought, okay, the startups are probably the, 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 the entities that are more willing to take risk, adopting new technologies, as opposed to probably incumbents. Again, uh, uh, so we developed our own uh, database, uh, which is not the same, no, in terms of numbers, passengers, to uh, startups working in the, in, in the field of, uh, of, of electricity. Uh, and what we used was uh, tools like Google, Twitter, and we're expanding it perhaps in, in a third step to LinkedIn. No? Uh, so these search engines are cheap no? to, to use, perhaps a little bit uh, uh, time intensive. Um, and the point that I want to make is that to develop this uh, uh, self-produced database is very important to have a um, multidisciplinary team. Uh, so um, uh, we're working in the team of electricity, also with a team of a, of a mother and involve them at early stages of the process of research. Uh, so we involve them, we, we tell them what we want to do, uh, how we are doing this, uh, and they help you uh, uh, to uh, new tools, new, new uh, uh, software where you can make it easier uh, to visualize uh, your results, to maintain the database, because if you are doing your, data, your own database, you have to keep it uh, 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 maintained. Um, so th this is very important. Uh, 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 in terms of research, I mean, to, to be involved uh, uh, with, the, with the users no? uh, <coughs> at the end of the, of the day. Thank you, and Orlando. Uh, Najla, you covered the data accessibility, and uh, as a government program, how would you ensure that the factual data is accessible? Um, thank you for that question. Um, firstly, I would like to apologize for coughing. Uh, for some reason, I've just gotten this, uh, this uh, intense cough. But um, uh, so in terms of accessibility and as a government program, it's very obvious that we don't necessarily create our own um, data reports, but we utilize them on a daily basis, whether it's to, you know, aggregate certain uh, numbers on um, oil trends, um, manufacturing trends, and so on. Um, how what we aim to achieve as a program and more specifically my department and the role that we play within the program is that raising of awareness 
because it's not about, you know, conducting yourself on certain media platforms or, um, you know, creating uh, spaces like this panel, for example, but it's really about how can I make this, th these numbers, this information, be accessible to someone, not just physically, but also mentally, theoretically, how can I make them understand that these numbers mean this, and this information means X, Y, Z. <clears throat> so we do that across multiple fronts. We do that with our work um, with other governments, uh, also trade associations, uh, research think tanks, um, and then you have the more traditional routes, you know, your social media, your um, uh, conversations on TV, so on and so forth. Um, and, and the idea here is that we would like this information to really be, you know, you had mentioned Google. I, I, I want to be able to put in something on Google and be able to see different views all on the same page. Yes, you know, we would need to utilize um, programmers. We would need to utilize a lot of certain words so that it gets showcased. Uh, on your front page. But what we're aiming to do as a program is to really start transitioning towards a, da a data set that is not only transparent, but able to bring in different opinions all at once. Because ultimately, that what, that's what ends up, you know, um, influencing policies. Thank you, Najla. Uh, Andres, I'll go back to you on the um, data challenges and the solutions that you see in developing models and forecasting techniques to enhance the economy trends and predictions. Can you uh, just l tell us uh, what challenges that you see in the data availability of data? Challenges to developing models and forecasting techniques the, to enhance the economic trend predictions. I'm, I'm sorry. It must be my hearing after all. Um, I need to go to the, to the ear doctor when I go back to England. Sure, no. But, but what was, um, perhaps as an intermediary between Rolando, but what was the exact question? It's the data challenges a solution you see in developing models and forecasting techniques to enhance economic trend predictions. predictions. So, so the challenges with respect to? Uh, developing model. models. Developing the models. Yes. yes. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, okay, well, once, once you've got the data and, and you're, you know, you've, you've got a, uh, an, an idea in mind and you use, um, you know, economic theory, um, um, then, you know, you know what to expect. And um, so, for example, when we, when, when we uh, you know, model airport capacity expansions, for example, or introduction of technology, uh, we, we model... Um, uh, each airline and airport uh, ultimately. So you've got more than 1,000 airports uh, in the system and, and we've got the various airlines that are competing for market share. Each airline has a network optimization model in order to maximize their profits, uh, three decision variables. You can uh, modify the, or they can modify the itinerary airfare. They can change the flight frequency on the various segments and they can rotate uh, the aircraft within the fleet uh, along the different routes. And so a, a very, you know, plausible check to see whether you can um, uh, uh, map, uh, match reality is to simply plot the uh, simulated numbers over the observed numbers and where you want to be is at a 45 degree straight line. And uh, if you're far off, then you ask the question, okay, what's, what's going on in this model? And in, in most cases, um, the reason is because you, you start, of course, from one region and then you go to the next one and, and you're missing out on the passengers that's coming into your system or you're losing that go out of your system's boundary. And if you do that, then the airlines will react differently. If you're missing passengers, international passengers, then they will use smaller aircraft sizes, reduce the flight frequencies and so forth. You get a completely different solution. So, so this, is, this is one of the challenges. This is what you were... <coughs> Did it respond to your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, my last question on data availability and accessibility, and uh, I want to hear from you all your reflections on that question is, 
And as an energy, uh, economic and climate data aggregators like CAPSARC, what, how we can benefit the global modelers more? Dr. Abdullah, I'll start with you on that. Uh, yeah, basically do uh, more of uh, uh, what you are already doing, which is basically, uh, basically making uh, uh, more user-friendly uh, micro simulation uh, models. What we found is that uh, decision makers, researchers, they want this. Uh, there is a higher demand for these micro simulation models, and uh, what we what's needed is to uh, have the data built in into these models. So, uh, data from census, uh, demographic uh, characterizations of consumers and uh, uh, suppliers, and where. Uh, transportation network as well. All of these uh, play a role in uh, capturing uh, all how energy uh, is used and consumed and uh, giving that into a context, uh, like the GIS context, which provide context for uh, adding variables like the temperature uh, or air quality, and the things that are niche now, and. Uh, frequently uh, uh, monitored or asked, uh, demanded to, 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 report, to be reported in new researches and, and uh, new KPIs, as uh, my colleague uh, mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Najla? Uh, Omar. Add to this? Oh, Omar, please. Um, uh, I cannot elaborate on that because I'm not an expert on the data modeling and visualization, but. Uh, from our perspective in data management offices, we uh, measure uh, the, we have a set of KPIs for each uh, domain of data. Uh, for example, uh, on the standard, we have uh, 15 domains uh, for data, and we are measuring uh, KPIs for each of them to make sure that we, have, we oversee uh, the data in the ecosystem, and uh, we can address any challenge or uh, flaws if we uh, noticed uh, any anything through uh, KPIs and uh, measuring them uh, over the time. Um, I, I think I, will, I would like to bring in the perspective of um, sort of policy and the role, uh, or mandated policy, perhaps. Um, I think, you know, um, if, if entities are being mandated to share an extent of their data for the purposes of X, Y, Z, with clear justification, standardization, regulation, then, um, you know, creating those hubs of knowledge uh, make that data easier to use, but also <clears throat> going back to this concept of, you know, user-friendly type um, aggregation as well as utilization. Um, I think, you know, creating that policy scheme to facilitate CAPSARC or other entities to really get this type of information um, could be a potential, you know, um, success story. We, you know, we'd have to see, but I, I would, I would presume that it would be. Thank you, Andreas. So, so let me just make sure I understand the question because I could understand Nadja, but, but uh, you gentlemen, I'm sorry. Um, so, what's the question? How to provide so data is, outputs in what a? What is the role? What do you think the role of uh, data aggregators, such as in CAPSARC, where we collect the data from the uh, sources and put it in on one platform? So, how we can help the benefit the modelers, uh, mo modelers, uh, global modelers more? How can data aggregators help modelers? How to aggregate the data? No, how the data aggregators, such as in CAPSARC, help modelers more? I'm sorry. Next time, I need to sit next to you. Okay. I have the question written down here, if you'd like. Ah, to. okay, that may help. <laughs> my, my, my reading is still okay. The second one. <clears throat> which, which letter? Which, which is it? uh, it's the second one. From the bottom? How might regional energy, economics, and climate data aggregate benefit? Ah, okay, thank you. No worries. Um, well, you know, from, from my perspective, um, and to be honest, I'm not a frequent CAPSAC data user because of the special niche market within which we are operating. Yeah. Um, 
in, in, in general, the, the more disaggregated the data is, I think the more useful it is because then, then you, uh, you know, then, then you don't run into problems that, that some, some users, um, you know, may have like more disaggregated data and, and others, they can aggregate it on their own, presumably. Um, I, I have been aware of, of, of the huge effort that CAPSAG is doing in terms of, uh, you know, data uh, management and provision, which is a very laudable activity, but in, in my specific niche market, there was no real use uh, for that until now. Yes, uh, well, uh, as a user, um, I mean, I would like the Capsar hub, I mean, to be a hub of a, a one shop for, uh, you know, the, the, the basic and extended uh, information, the data that you need uh, 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 in this field of energy and, and, and environment, I mean, to be complete, to be exhaustive, uh, and also, I mean, this is my wish list, uh, uh, to make it accessible, uh, easy to manipulate, comparable between diff different uh, 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 databases, data sets, um, easy to, to download and manipulate, you know? Uh, that being said, of the current and existing uh, data. Uh, however, I, I would also like Capsar to be uh, forward-looking in the, in the way of, uh, of acquiring uh, new data, you know? uh, uh, perhaps from uh, research that has been done here at Capsar, and they, that like, like uh, uh, the work that, that we did and others uh, of developing your own databases, I think that could add a, 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 a competitive advantage of a Capsar as a hub. I mean, we have a, 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 here you have um, huge human power uh, that, that are doing research, and how do you incorporate and uh, uh, standardize that uh, information will be very helpful. Thank you, Rolando. Uh, I'll move now to my second topic, which is the data governance and data transparency. And a key question here, Dr. Abdullah, if you can uh, guide us through how to strike a compromise between uh, data security and privacy issues. Well, uh, uh, trying to uh, strike a trade-off or compromise between those two uh, conflicting goals is usually uh, uh, requires speci special uh, consideration. Uh, we have, uh, in our organization, we have a department concerned with the uh, release of microdata and uh, putting uh, statistical disclosure controls. Uh, and we are enabling researchers to, uh, to uh, get a percentage of the data, like the raw data, but after masking it and, and doing the special treatment, it's not going to be raw data, it's, but then we call it after treatment micro data, which is at the record level. Uh, the only thing we do, or, or it becomes easier if uh, the spatial scale or, or the spatial identifier of the record is not asked or not requested, because that makes, uh, that makes uh, the impact of the SDC or statistical dis disclosure controls on the data given make it less. However, when uh, users ask for uh, spatial identifiers of these records, then uh, the impact will be on on, uh, on many uh, on, on all of the variables because the more we add variables, the more identifiable is the record uh, or the person giving that information. So. We uh, recommend usually users uh, to ask only for the variables they need for their research because this way uh, we don't add another variable and then have a larger impact of SDC uh, controls. Uh, the other consideration is, uh, is to have a legal construct between organizations uh, that that way is uh, uh, in academia or universities will uh, have more internal processes uh, and scrutiny uh, on their researchers so uh, they don't violate uh, uh, data agreement or, or, or uh, privacy uh, uh, considerations set forth by, by our organization. Hope that uh, covers you. this question. Uh, Omar, we'll go back with you to the technologies and uh, the trends. But
but this time on data management and visualization. Um, how can it help to assess, to address the difficulties <coughs> with the data consistency and the completeness and currency of data? Uh, there are many uh, data management uh, technologies to address this uh, type of issues. Um, maybe I will mention some of them. For example, the data lineage tracking. Uh, this uh, technology will help the users to, uh, uh, to uh, trace the data from the creation to the, uh, to the, to, to the systems, so what edits has been done, what updates uh, affected uh, the quality of this data. Another uh, data management technology is uh, the data versioning, where uh, you, uh, you store uh, some uh, versions of this data and go back for, uh, to, to check what change has been done uh, to this data. Um, maybe uh, another uh, data management uh, technology is the data virtualization, uh, where uh, you have a layer between the user and uh, the data warehouse or the data. Uh, the user can access this layer and uh, manipulate the data, access the data, generate any visualizations they want without the need to uh, download this data or uh, uh, re replicate it. Mm -hmm. So uh, these technologies will help uh, to address issues related to the completeness and correctness and, uh, uh, of, the, of the data. Um, uh, Maybe um, we are trying right now in the ministry to implement a to, such a tool to, uh, to deliver this data virtualization idea and enable everybody in the ecosystem to do their own analysis, to do their own visualizations uh, without the need to uh, replicate the data, which might affect the data quality and availability in the future. Rolando, you want to reflect on that question as well? Uh, not to the spe this is a specific question, but uh, um, I, I was uh, thinking about uh, what Andreas uh, said at the beginning, that uh, the open, the more data available, uh, more open are in the U.S., and also thinking about the, the role of uh, ag statistical agencies in countries. It's in the interest of, uh, of a statistical agencies in different countries to reach to the level of the U.S., the gold standard, uh, because I mean, I, I, I would think that, uh, Andreas, most of your research should be then about the U.S. No? Or, I, I don't know. I, I mean, because there's that available. And uh, if, if that is the case, then you are cross-subsidizing uh, uh, researchers and research time uh, to the field, to the country where probably they don't, they, 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 there's less need for that, no? Well, aviation is a global problem, of oh, course. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. is a significant... Um, agent, you know, in, in, the, in the aviation sector, of course, but other countries are becoming increasingly more important the more you move to the east of our planet, and there's not much data out there that you can get for free. In, in, in the U.S., it, it's mainly a um, transparency issue, I believe, because, again, companies from a certain revenue stream on, they have to report their um, operations and financials, and this is what researchers benefit from. So let's move to data quality and measuring data quality um, and how to rate the data quality in the context of models and analysis. I'll start with you, Dr. Abdullah. How the uh, generative statistics measure data quality? Uh, we have two frameworks. Uh, one is uh, data quality, which is uh, dimensions, which is nine dimensions, uh, maybe similar to the DAMA used by the Energy uh, Ministry of Energy, and then we have the statistical uh, dimensions, which uh, which uh, which usually covers the same uh, the timeliness, uh, consistency, comparability, uh, accuracy. So these dimensions are usually assessed for data uh, quality or statistical production quality, uh, and uh, it's done by a, a different department. So. We don't have conflict of interest when, when statistical units publishes their uh, their publications or produce their publications and check the quality. So it's separated from the uh, statistical units producing the same uh, 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 publications uh, and verified by independent departments. So that's how we do it and uh, using international standards. Uh, 
from the UN uh, statistical division and the same as the framework, uh, the DAMA framework. Omar? So uh, the data quality best practices, they, we usually measure the five dimensions of data quality, which is uh, accuracy, completeness, uh, timeliness, uh, timeliness, and uh, consistency, and validity. Uh, so uh, we have multiple tools. We implemented multiple technologies in the ministry to make sure that all the data we collect is uh, up to the standard. Um, uh, we use uh, cost benefits uh, analysis to make sure uh, to, to measure the effect of poor, data, uh, poor data uh, and uh, what is the cost behind it. Uh, also, uh, we are using some statistical models to measure uh, statistical techniques to measure the models and uh, the quality of the results. Um, uh, additional way is uh, to uh, also work with, uh, with the user feedback to collect uh, the response and satisfaction of the users uh, of these an analytics and models and uh, get their ideas about uh, what is the quality of the outcome of, this, uh, of the resulting uh, data of or analytics of this uh, um, visualizations or uh, analysis. Andreas, can you reflect on that as well? So that's the data quality yes. issue. So, so um, well, before we estimate any model, of course, we look very carefully at, at the data. And the way we do it, we simply plot it. So you get the you know, airfare data, and, and you get the original destination. You can work out what the great circle distance is. You, 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 you plot the airfare over the distance, and what you expect to see is a decline in the airfare um, per kilometer. Over, over the distance, and then you can easily see whether there are outliers. You look at those, and in many cases, the data is just of poor quality. Or, you know, if you look at uh, aircraft fuel burn data from, from US Form 41 data, which is free, freely available, there are also basic laws of physics that, uh, you know, mandate um, the, the range within which this data can vary. Um, over aircraft stage length, for example, it has to follow a certain pattern, and if it doesn't, then you know you look at it more carefully and try to understand why. And, and there are reason why, reasons why it, it can vary, and um, but uh, if uh, if it still varies, under taking into account the reasons, then the data is simply not robust, and you better don't use it. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, my last question is for you, Rolando. And this will open also the discussion for our next session at uh, 4 p.m. Is the question is what constitutes evidence in an evidence-based mm. policy making? Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a, a, a good question. Um, throughout, I mean, the discussion in this session is data, but uh, we have to put data in in context. Uh, we need data, which is not the same as information, which is not the same as knowledge, and it's probably not the same as evidence. So. Of course, it's an input for all, all, for all that. Um, so at the end, uh, what we want as researchers, as advisors to policy makers, to decision makers, is to provide evidence so that they, ca they can make some decisions. Uh, again, even evidence is not uh, the same. It's not a, a common definition. It can vary by uh, different disciplines. Uh, some people say, OK, uh, uh, ev evidence can be also political. No? Um, there are some people that are more pragmatic and they are just comfortable with that good enough uh, evidence, whereas some other people might say, okay, no, this has to be hardcore evidence to make some, some other decisions. Um, so le I, I think my, my message is that let's not forget that all this that we discuss is at the end uh, to provide evidence for someone who will make a decision that will affect people. Yeah. Thank you, and Rolando. So it's time now to open the floor for audience for your questions. Uh, please, if you have any question, raise your hand, uh, state your name and where you're from and who you want to address your question. Uh, can you have the mic? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Emre Hatipolo, a oil and gas fellow at CAPSARC. The question is open to panel, uh, but please feel free to any of you to pick up. It's about completeness. Uh, I'll rephrase it another way, uh, missing data. I'm a political scientist by training, and we have a lot of studies that show that if you don't treat missing data in detail, uh, your results are flawed, and they're not just. 
uh, they give erroneous results, and it's a very tricky thing because you can easily overlook missing data by just interpolation, extrapolation, or take two similar countries' data and just <coughs> impute it in that missing country's data. So I'm just wondering what kind of standards or shared practices you have to ensure that the data is complete in a just and representative and non-biased way. Thank you. I think Omar, you can take that. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard to, uh, to, to find out these uh, issues related to data, like completeness, but uh, we're, uh, most of the time we're uh, 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 addressing our uh, subject matter experts in the domains uh, to uh, get their uh, feedback about, the, about this data, if it's complete or not. Uh, and then we can, some, uh, we can have some improvement, uh, improvement mechanism and plans to complete the missing parts of this data. So uh, there is, uh, I didn't have like a specific uh, approach to that, but uh, the, the currently we are using user feedback and uh, surveys uh, to get uh, the feedback about the completeness of the data. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, do you want to reflect on that question as well? Basically, we, uh, we have uh, in place data quality assessment, and uh, we try to uh, produce data in a complete format. It's like if we produce a variable, uh, we make sure the completeness factor is satisfied. Otherwise, we don't publish it. And we, may we might, might have it internally, but it's incomplete. We know it's not uh, in terms of quality, it's not good to be published. So we release a publication that has most information uh, about the topic we are covering, but we, we don't release that factor, which is uh, in the standards, uh, the international standards should be released, but we don't release it because of, of incompleteness. And uh, yes, uh, sometimes we, uh, uh, perfection is enemy of good, and we, we, we do release what's good and what's uh, uh, accurate data, and uh, the things that are, uh, the variables or the factors that are, are, uh, have a lot of missing variables, we, we just uh, don't add them to the publication. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, any uh, other questions? Can I answer the question? Yeah, sure. So, so it's about data standards when you publish it. Yes. So, so everything we publish is, is on our website, it's documented, and most of it undergoes outside peer review because it's published in journals. And uh, this, this relates to the model. We've got various validation peer-reviewed papers that, 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 that show you know, how, how we validate the models. And uh, so how well we reproduce, uh, you know, base year values and then, uh, you know, use the models to look into the future. And the same applies to data. And everything has to be well documented, otherwise there's no trust in it. Having said that, we are only a university and we have no, you know, dedicated funds in order to do this uh, evening greater rigor in detail. But we, we try to do, as, to do it as uh, rigorous as we can with the means that we have available. I think, uh, Emre, also it depends on the research question, you know, as, as always. Um, for example, in, in our case that we are trying to understand innovation in startups, it's really difficult to know the universe of startups in the world. You no, know, perhaps there are some uh, kids working in their mom's garage, and I mean, that, that's not recorded. No? Uh, our research question is to try to understand the key drivers, the, the key megatrends, and also the key players. So we have uh, uh, now like, 800 uh, startups. Are there some startups that are missing there? Perhaps. No, I mean, perhaps uh, uh, with certainty. Are there startups that are relevant that are not there? Very unlikely. So I, I, I think it depends on, on, on also on what you are trying to achieve. Thank you, Rolando. Uh, we have a question here. Yes, thank you very much for this excellent discussion. My question uh, builds on... Uh, Nora, can you raise your voice? Yeah. My question builds on the earlier uh, question by you, Sadim, to the panel on the governance of data. Data accessibility and availability is a 
major problems, particularly from government entities. You know, this um, complicates matters because you have problems with transparency, credibility. So it's a very important problem to address. My question is to the GSTAT um, speaker. Are there any governance frameworks, standardization, verification of data, any um, um, governance structure that you can elaborate on that requires stakeholders to provide uh, more details on data, uh, particularly verification. If I can give an example of, for instance, uh, emission measurement, standardization, verification um, of um, particular um, activity, perhaps afforestation for the Saudi Green Initiative as a simple example. Are there like a loop system where you require some entities to provide data and, and update these uh, data? Thank you. Uh, if I understand you well, uh, you are asking if JASTAT has uh, like uh, uh, collects data based on uh, regulations or governments uh, governance in place. So uh, yes, uh, we we have uh, in our regulations that uh, we we uh, our regu our, our uh, mandate allow us to uh, collect data from all government entities, and then uh, publish on aggregate levels. But uh, some, some data is, is simply is, is not available or is not accurate. Uh, should, I don't know if this answers your question or concern. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Any other questions uh, we have? Go ahead, Fakhri. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts. At the same time, I would like to take... Uh, Fakhri, we can't hear you, please. Um, I, I would like to thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts. And at the same time, I would like to take the opportunity of having a JSTAT representative, Dr. Amar Abdullah, here and ask my question, uh, which is about data availability. So, as you rightly mentioned, uh, we have very fascinating data on labor survey and employment by sector, which is very helpful for detailed research. Uh, I would like to thank you for that. My question is about, do you have any plan for coming future? Uh, make the same for investment data? I mean, investment broken into sectors and type of investment, like domestic and foreign investment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fakhri. Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, maybe I'm not, uh, but we have a department that uh, we started a new unit for uh, investment. Uh, it's in the under the economics uh, statistics. It's, a, it's called the investment statistics. It covers FDI and the uh, domestic the, uh, investments and the details based on the international. They are building the methodologies now and uh, collecting data. I'll double check if uh, the surveys or, 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 or publications are going to be recently published, but uh, we, we can check later. Okay. We have a question over there. Thank you for this uh, interesting and timely uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'd like just to highlight, uh, if, if you can add, uh, on the new era of data. We used to handle data previously on our desktop or laptop uh, machines now. Nowadays, we move to the big data and, and uh, data mining machines. Uh, for example, if we need to put the right policy for energy efficiency or uh, demand side management, we have to have uh, an access to the hourly or probably uh, minute by minute uh, consumption from each individual in the community. Uh, or if we need to study the, the traffic, uh, probably we can uh, uh, get access to the uh, uh, road uh, cameras data. So we are talking about uh, giga or terawatt, uh, terabyte uh, size of data. How can uh, this era, uh, new era of data, can enter to the uh, policy-driven uh, data analysis in, in the current uh, status or in the future when the data it piles up in, in, in triple or, or quadral uh, sizes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, do you want to address the question to a specific panelist? 
Okay, so it's open. Who do you want to reflect on the question? Andreas. <laughs> I, I, I would love to respond, but I, I'm just not sure I fully understood the question. Huh. Orlando, can, can you, you, you are next to me. Can you translate it for me? Yes, go ahead. Well, just, um, uh, we are talking about the, the big data. Yeah. The data now, uh, our digital uh, lifestyle collecting every second. How can this size of data be utilized for driven, uh, data-driven uh, policy uh, studies? So, so if I understood your question correctly, and that's, that's the if, um, you know, we, we, we are used to using massive amounts of data, and, and we also work with, with, with cli closely with climate scientists who, even, who use even more massive amounts of data. And um, I've, I've got colleagues who are extremely excited about huge data sets and, and running diagnostics and estimating models, but then what we would make available to the outside world is something that has already been processed and be more readily usable, because uh, I suspect most, most folks would not like to go through the same exercise, which is quite time consuming and requires also uh, you know, um, knowledge in the respective discipline in order to, to process um, um, the data. Okay. Thank you. Can Any I other questions? Yeah. If, you, uh, if you allow me, I will uh, okay, add uh, some highlights yes. about this uh, question. Um, uh, right now, our cities are transformed to, into smart cities, cognitive cities, and maybe Neom will be the first cognitive city in Saudi Arabia. So uh, this means that uh, these cities will use the data in the cities uh, related to multiple dimensions for uh, multiple domains. One of them is energy domain. So uh, this uh, big data concept will raise uh, multiple concerns about uh, personal data privacy and other uh, other any uh, issues or challenges. So uh, nationally, uh, we uh, started to develop multiple policies related to the personal data protection, data classification, to make sure that we are ready for this type of technologies and uh, for using this type of uh, big data in the future. Thank you, Omar. So one last question. Oh, uh, uh, in, in economics, there's the debate whether uh, big data will uh, finish some theoretical debates. No, uh, Raj Shetty from Harvard University, uh, he argues that it's evidence, uh, everything can be settled by, uh, by what the evidence uh, uh, says. Um, and this has led, I think, uh, to, to some uh, research, we saw it in, in, in the COVID pandemic, where uh, people started to estimate absolutely everything. No, uh, you get more chances to get uh, 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 contagions in a coffee shop instead of a in a, which are the safest uh, jobs, a florist, a coffee shop, a uh, bartender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and something, some questions that perhaps are uh, a little bit far off, you know, like a, uh, uh, this event cost this number of, uh, of uh, COVID and cases, uh, et cetera. So the point uh, that I want to make is that let's not forget uh, about theory. Uh, so all these big data sets, all this uh, uh, big data has to be uh, consistent with uh, economic theory. Uh, so that, 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 that's, uh, uh, otherwise I think we will rely on uh, spurious correlations between uh, uh, two observations. Thank you, Rolando. So we have a question here. Go ahead. Thank you for an interesting topic, especially for uh, researcher. So we know in uh, data not available uh, and high cost for researcher. How the researcher can get this data easy way? Okay. Are you addressing to someone in the panel? Uh, for, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Michael or Ronaldo. So, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, the, uh, the data not available for researcher uh, easy or high cost. So how can the academy or researcher getting the data? That's a good question that perhaps uh, uh, you and the can. <laughs> if you repeat the question for me, well, yeah, I'll... that, that uh, uh, big data bases are expensive. So how an academic can get a hold of a, of a 
that they thought were done, <laughs> perhaps grants. <laughs> Write a, a good uh, funding proposal and just pray that you are successful <laughs> because it's a lottery, even if it's a good one. Um, otherwise, perhaps um, try to connect with um, you know, research groups who have more easy access and more money and work with them, that might be an alternative route. If I, if I just... It's a big issue. So, sorry. No, no, please. Um, I, I can also add on to that. Uh, another potential possibility could be that there are certain funding agencies. They're not banks, but they're sort of like a commercial-based... Uh, agency and and what they do is that they dedicate some of their budgeting for research um, a lot of the NGOs that work on specific scientific research and or medical research will have a dedicated funding mechanism that you could apply for um, but it is similar to to the process you had mentioned that you'd apply and then pray that you'll get it <laughs> And, and perhaps that is also related to my, uh, what I said in my first intervention of this data divide of uh, 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 rich countries, rich uh, people, rich researchers having a hold of, uh, of data and while uh, uh, those who are not probably not. Uh, uh, and perhaps that is also, I mean, the role of government to step in and, uh, uh, and improve the quality of uh, quantity of, uh, of, of data as well. We have one minute for one last question. Omar, can you get the mic? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation and uh, discussion and the dialogue. For me, the question is more to the audience than to the uh, uh, panel speakers. We know each one of you are doing your best to get the data out there so the researchers can use. And this kind of links to the point that we discussed, how can we make data social? That means when you provide the data, how is the feedback coming back into you? So now there are technologies that are available, almost like Facebook. You still have the, your own data in the way how you published it. And there are comments coming in from the people who use that data. So I think that is missing a big time. Uh, it's not that technology is a problem. Like, for example, the CAPSOC data portal, for every data set, you can go and comment about the data set. In five years, we received 14 comments. So there is a responsibility from the consumer side. Just because you got the data, first of all, you don't have the data, we understand. When we make it available, when you use it, you got to come back and critique, comment, appreciate, whatever you want to do right next to the data set so the publishers know what to correct, how to improve it. So technology is not uh, you know, reducing the uh, compact. Um, I think making social, uh, making data social is very important. There need to be First of all, thank you for coming into this panel because you're already coming together to address from publisher consumer viewpoint, but there is a, so, um, from consumers, researchers, academia, they need to give back something when they get the data. That give back is probably 10 minutes of comments, how they use the data, was it useful? Because same data could be useful for one set of users and useless for the others. But if they come and give that comment and feedback, that'll be really helpful for the aggregators. And when you talked about the data quality, I would just want to make sure there were data definitions and glossaries published. Without that, data is mostly useless for a variety of use cases. So any comments to this will be great. Right to your point, and thanks for the, we, we have the same thing as you have, uh, you mentioned. Uh, the, starting, uh, Actually, yesterday, we changed uh, the methodologies we publish with every uh, statistical publication. That high-level wording and small definitions, that will be completely changed. And we are publishing in a state uh, metadata report, which encompasses methodology and all the glossaries, definitions, and uh, uh, resources. It's just same way as uh, 
uh, in the leading statistical offices that we benchmarked ourselves with. So that's first thing, first part. And uh, to your point, uh, we d yes, we don't receive that much feedback except from major stakeholders or main stakeholders, which are mainly governmental agencies. Uh, and but but we address individual uh, feedbacks. Uh, we have a portal where individuals, researchers mainly in, 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 uh, in colleges and universities, when they ask for data and they, uh, it's, some, some of them are resistant and uh, you, you, because we see these requests come to us and uh, ask for more data, like more detailed, more granular data. And we have a policy that we started recently which allows us to give uh, 10% of or, or to researchers of, of sample size uh, so they can uh, see the actual data, the raw data, after being uh, uh, treated for statistical disclosure controls, which is being basically masking the important uh, individual uh, variables. So thanks for your comment and we welcome as you uh, more feedback for our uh, products. So with that note, uh, it's almost lunchtime, so I don't want to hold you in um, any longer. Thank you. Sincere thanks to all the panelists for being here today. And thank you also for the uh, audience, for your questions, and for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you.